Hello everyone, it's Ian Scanlon here, questioning Bitcoin at Rabbit Hole Stories. I hope everyone's okay. Uh, as you know, we are doing Rabbit Hole Stories. Uh, mine was last episode, and because we thought it would be only um, the right thing to do to get our rabbit hole stories out there, just to sort of get things going. Um, so you had mine last episode. Uh, I hope you all listened to it and enjoyed it. Again, if you've got any feedback or questions, please fire them our way. Uh, we'd be happy to answer them and keep the conversation going. And today, uh, my co-host, Joel is with me. Hello, Joel. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Thank you. I'm really doing okay. Thanks. Um, so today is your turn. Um, you're up now, um, with your rabbit hole story and do you know what, Joel, I was thinking about this. I don't really know too much about your rabbit hole story. <laughs> so it's going to be, uh, a learning, um, it's going to be an experience for me to think about and, and hear what you, where you're coming from as well. Um, so I'm intrigued um, about about your rabbit hole story. But do you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit, Joel? Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, if I sound a bit voicey, uh, dare I say if I sound sexy, that's down to a throat, uh, a, a sore throat. So if it sounds very nice, uh, I'll try to keep that voice for the remainder of the episode. <laughs> um, but I might crack sometimes or drink a glass of water. So sorry from that end. Um, yeah, my name is Joel, uh, Joel Kai Lentz, if you want to go by my full name, uh, fully doxing myself, but that's okay. Uh, where, where shall I start? I mean, I'm, I'm 26. I, I currently live in London, so that's to get the full spectrum out there. Um, and I mainly work as a uh, content writer, meaning I write content, as it says, for uh, clients, companies, to fulfill their needs on various ends. Brilliant. 26 years old and living in London. Um, but that's not a London accent, is it, Joel? No, 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 no. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was born and raised in Switzerland. Um, and uh, for, for a long time, actually, I wanted to move to London just because I have my friend circle here. Um, I, I actually do like the city. I know this is like a bad thing to say these days because everyone thinks London is failing miserably. Um, but I like the people I met here. Um, and uh, yeah, so I moved here a couple of months ago. But I'm originally from Switzerland. I lived there all my life. I've um, been traveling all my life as well. So sort of, sort of the best of Europe all my time. Um, and fun fact, I'm dual citizen. So I'm Austrian and Swiss uh, because of my uh, family's heritage and stuff. So I sort of saw the whole, sort of saw the whole of Central Europe, um, but decided to to live on this, in my opinion, beautiful island. Well, you are more than welcome. It's happy. I'm happy to have you here, and um, yeah, it's great that we connected uh, back at the London Bitcoin Meetup um, those months ago, and um, I'm just really keen now to sort of get to know you a little bit more mm. and to find out. Um, a little bit about your Bitcoin story and how you got into Bitcoin and why you stuck around. Yeah, that's a good way to start there. So I initially got into Bitcoin because I read an article in The Guardian of all places, back when I used to read The Guardian. And um, yeah, it was, I, I can actually link it in the show notes. So, cause I saved that one. That's like my start into the whole oh, thing. Cool. And it's basically the, um, the story about Silk Road. Uh, I think how it got uncovered, what happened, all of these things. And um, I read about this thing called Bitcoin back in there. Um, funnily enough, I always mispronounce it. I said Bitcoin. So for some reason <laughs> that stuck around, but then obviously through getting to it, I called it Bitcoin. Um, and I was intrigued. I mean, I, f I thought, um, okay, this sounds interesting. Um, I can basically pay someone at the other end of the world with magic internet money. Um, and I used to play a lot of like online games with friends back in the days. So it sort of had the feeling of your game token, your, um, magic world of Warcraft money. Uh, and sort of from that perspective, I looked at it, I, uh, started Googling, I found a white paper and I had enough of a technical understanding to get the, the main parts of it all. 
So, um, I mean, basically what really intrigued me was the title, peer-to-peer -peer money system or payment system. I thought like, wow, mm. no one in the middle. Because even back then, I fucking hated banks. I can get to that right later. Um, and yeah, I just started reading and I found it interesting. And obviously once I got in, I sort of started Googling some more. Um, and I stumbled upon the um, Bitcoin talk forum back then. Um, and this was in 2013. So it wasn't really, th there was no Bitcoin Twitter, um, even though people had Twitter accounts and such. Um, and you just met online um, and I stuck around for two or three years. Um, basically trying to mine Bitcoin. I was naive enough to think I can do it on my laptop. Quickly found out this is not possible even back then. Um, so I, I got on mining board with friends. Um, they continued mining. I focused more on spending Bitcoin. Um, you went to Bitcoin meetups. You, you, you used Bitcoin ATMs back in the day. That was a big thing. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of how I got in. And um, the main reason was just that I wanted to use internet money or the magic internet money uh, because it was more, way, way more convenient than using PayPal or any bank out there. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so back in 2013, so you're 20, you, you, you were very young, Joel, getting into to Bitcoin. And you mentioned uh, like World of Warcraft and trading tokens. Was that something that you was kind of into in, in your younger um, years and still into now? I mean, I just played World of Warcraft because all of my friends played it. You know, it was sort of the, the online meeting hub. Um, WhatsApp already existed and all of that stuff, but it was just more of a mm. casual meeting place besides school and such. Um, but I was never really interested in the trading side of things. I had friends who flipped all of that stuff. Right. Sort of collectibles and such as well. Um, I was just interested in using something that doesn't rely on a bank because I had a lot of experience. I was traveling a lot in Europe uh, using different in, uh, using different money forms, like using the euro, mm -hmm. I lived in Switzerland, so I used Swiss francs. Uh, and then you sort of went on that trip and realizing, holy shit, convert rates are inconvenient. Uh, the right. banks are closed on the weekends, which is something I never understood. Uh, so especially if you travel, you maybe want to take something out of your savings. You're not able to do that on a Sunday afternoon, um, which again, I never understood it completely. So I was more interested in really the, the spending aspect of it and not having to ask someone, um, Hey, is it okay if I spend my own money? Um, so th that's what initially drew me in. Um, but yeah, I was never into trucks or anything, so I didn't buy anything on Silk Road. <laughs> Um, still don't. So that was not something I w would have stuck around in. And, uh, 2013 was a weird year in my life because I got the first contact points with what I later would do. And, uh, besides that, you know, privacy was a big thing. Snowden just un or released his leaks on the NSA and everything. So it was sort of a weird timing in the world where I thought, uh, this, this internet token thing, which you can send just uh, by having an address. That sounds nice. So really the whole Silk Road thing was kind of like your initial um, step into the space. Would you say that? That's, that's yeah, how you yeah. came to discovery. And that was from an article uh, in the Guardian yeah. at, at the time. And finding out that there's something that you can just sort of use and utilize to your benefit by transferring money from one place to another, which was easier than actually the current system that existed at that time, um, is something that obviously captivated you and, and, and kept you in the space. But since then, what, what is it about Bitcoin that has made you stay other than just the transacting between people that is, that is convenient from one person to another? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, many different things. Obviously, once you, you fall down the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you uncover so many different avenues. I mean, from energy to what is money, essentially, Austrian economics and all of these things. Um, there are a couple of things that kept me going, still keep me going to this day. But I think the number one thing was, um, again, the freedom choice. I can mm. spend my own money how I want to. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, obviously, 2013 up till 2016. So I was just dabbling. I was um, getting started. Like I, I, the first time I bought Bitcoin was at a Bitcoin ATM, 
where you just went in with cash and you got a paper wallet out of it. Um, non KYC, obviously. So that was, that mm, was pretty cool. Mm. Like, okay, I put my, my regular salary working money in and I get it out and I can then scan a QR code on an app on my phone and I can send that money to a friend of mine in South Africa. So that fascination kept me going for three years, essentially, how you to use that money internationally. And then just everything that evolves around it. I started um, digging up the history behind Bitcoin. I'm a big history buff. So that's one of the things I was interested in if I get going with stuff. Um, and, and then I saw this Satoshi Nakamoto person, group, whoever it is. Uh, that was yeah. fascinating. Um, and then you just keep going. Like I eventually found my way into the human rights aspect, which I'm very much interested in. Um, I would say probably more than like the, the savings economics aspect. Um, but then obviously you stumble across stuff like, um, libertarianism, mm -hmm. um, Austrian economics, and you sort of start picking up your pieces. Um, but I think I had more of a breakout later on, uh, in my Bitcoin journey, which I'm sure we get to later on as well. So well, you, you were like fascinated about the history behind Bitcoin. Um, and I am too, I, this, I'm quite new on that journey because I've, I mm. kind of, um, I was, I, I came into Bitcoin later than you, um, uh, but I've kind of went on a different, uh, path personally, um, mm. with just looking at the current situation now and thinking about the future, but that's something I want to spend a bit more time doing is researching the history of Bitcoin, uh, just to get a more full picture of, of, of Bitcoin as a whole. What, if I was to start looking back into the history of Bitcoin, where, where would you start? Where, where would you recommend I start looking? Yeah, I think I have a bit of an unpopular opinion here. Um, at least for Bitcoiners, uh, mm. start with what money is and basically start at the beginning, uh, where instead of having state issued IOUs, you had, um, salt and stones and whatever you had back in the day centuries, even millions of years ago, probably, uh, where they would exchange something and understand what that is. So there's a whole mm. area you can cover there. Um, and through that, I think you then start at, um, I like to call it the Bitcoin tree. Um, I'm still trying to find a tweet where I have the whole thing in there. So I'll link it in the show notes if I find it, where essentially you, you cover the whole basis of what is money. Again, takes you probably, I don't know, 5,000 years terms of historical context. Mm -hmm. And then you get to that point in the 60s, 70s, 80s, where uh, obviously America based, you had sort of the, the uh, JFK assassination. Uh, then you get into the Nixon Watergate story. And somewhere in the middle there, cryptography starts becoming a topic because some very intelligent people realized, hey, the, the state is not out for good. The government will try and seize more power or try and seize property from you. Uh, they've done it in the past as well. So um, how can we protect ourselves against that? And that will initially get you down the cyberpunk role or the cyberpunk road, which took, I'm guessing, 25 years to evolve to a point where it uh, truly uh, became big in the 90s. And that will then lead you into Bitcoin and all of the familiar people. So um, I wouldn't, I couldn't guide you to like one particular book, but I'll try and find that tree because it, it really encapsulates the whole story behind Bitcoin. And it, it's not really something Satoshi did in, in 08, 09, I guess. Um, it really is a 40 mm. year story plus more if you take in the fact that what money is. That's, that's interesting because yeah, you're absolutely right. Bitcoin just didn't magically appear out of nowhere, out of thin air that it, it, it came from somewhere and it, if you really look um, into the detail of, of the history, yeah, I can see how it, it really goes way beyond the concept of what even cryptography was. It, it starts mm. way earlier than that, what led, led to cryptography in the first place and the evolution of, of, of what then eventually evolved into Bitcoin. That's, that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned gold um, yeah. a minute ago, Joel. What, uh, what do you want to say about gold? I mean, I, again, I have a bit of a different um, perspective than probably 
very toxic Bitcoin maximalists. I'm sure we're getting into the topic of that later on as well. Um, so quick backstory. I mean, everything we do these days in terms of monetary exchange or in terms of even Bitcoin exchange um, has some form, link or connection to gold. Uh, famously, the US as a last uh, resort went off the gold standard in 1971. Um, they didn't go actually, they're still in their trial phase. Uh, it was never <laughs> promised that they would cut it off completely, but obviously well, it was only, it was more only than 50 years, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, more or less. Um, but yeah, if you look at the, the basis of what is Bitcoin and what is gold, you'll find a lot of comparisons. Uh, again, I'll try and find a lot of the, the tables and everything to link below, but you'll see that gold and Bitcoin are very connected to each other, which is something I cherish because to me, we shouldn't have the Bitcoin or uh, the, the digital sound money camp at the sound money camp per se, which is all one thing. So the advantage of Bitcoin, and this is why I see it as a big plus, obviously, is we can take it everywhere. We're not relying on central exchanges. We're not relying on um, central authority, especially. Mm -hmm. So this is where, in my opinion, it has a big plus. Big drawdown, if you like to look at price, obviously it's volatile, but I mean, the technology is 14 years old. Anything that's new and upcoming, it gets traded. Um, it, it has the, these price movements. So the older, the more established it gets, the more people it get on board, the less more volatility you'll see in the future. And the more it sort of um, gets into a safe space where you can say, okay, this is sort of like stocks or trades or whatever. Um, but the reason I'm not diminishing gold is because if you look at gold from, again, a theoretical standpoint, um, everything that happened in Bitcoin has a connection to gold, especially all of these cyberpunks. A lot of them early on tried to replicate digital gold. They failed individually. Again, my theory, when they collectively came together, they managed to form Bitcoin. Um, under that pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. I, I'm really believing it's not one person. Uh, mm, we did that. Mm. But sort of, if you look at these connections, I'm looking at gold as like, okay, it's not bad in all it is. Um, obviously there's paper gold and this is like 200 to one to normal gold and all of these things and central banks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but at the end of the day, the raw function of gold is very similar to Bitcoin, just that Satoshi evolved and did a couple of more security steps and obviously he digitized it to um, make it able to be spent everywhere in the world, possibly everywhere in the galaxy. Uh, once we get to that point where we can like hop on planes and go to other planets. Yes. And you've got the, the building blocks of what is, or what the, not the building blocks, but the, what is, um, creates a value in in something for it to be used as a, a currency and it's got to be the durability uh, mm -hmm. the fungibility and the list that goes on of the, the things that um will constitute something as as what people might deem as valuable and yep. you also gold's got like a, a five thousand year history um with being used um in, in trade, that's my understanding anyway, my limited understanding of, of gold. Um, but the problem that I, I see with gold is that every single civilization that has used gold has always debased it. They yeah. always, uh, always, um, kept it close to them and diluted it for everyone else. Um, but with Bitcoin, do you see that as, as something that, Bitcoin fixes? To a certain extent. I mean, obviously one could say now, if I got a thousand Bitcoin in 2010 at like, I don't know what the price was, probably 10 cents per Bitcoin. Um, and I hodled them through to today. Um, that is a big, a, a big return on your investment. Mm. If you look at it from that perspective, but also you're bound to those 1000 Bitcoins. If we get to a future where all of the Bitcoins are mined. Um, there will be a Bitcoin standard on which people live in. Surely you could say the one guy with a thousand Bitcoin has more power in terms of social, economical standpoints than the guy owning maybe one Bitcoin or half a Bitcoin, whatever it is. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a problem Bitcoin in itself brings with it. That's just human greed 
and human error at the end of the day, because the person or the group of people who's um, earliest, closest, whatever it might be, to a um, source of information or income or whatever will always benefit. So I think that's one thing Bitcoin can't fix because it's nature and it's given. Um, but what it does, it, it allows me in London or uh, a, a bloke in South Africa to both own a part of Bitcoin or even more than a part and, and being able to verify it all around the world and not manipulate it. And that's the biggest thing for me personally, where, and mm -hmm. this is my big drawback with gold, you can't do that. Yes, I can keep my coin. Yes, I can um, sort of have my own gold with me. But what if a Metroid hits like Earth? There's more gold on it, maybe. Um, or what if all of the central banks succeed and they buy all the gold and no one is able to go to a gold broker anymore? So these are sort of the things where I'm still skeptical. So I'm still a Bitcoin at first, but I appreciate what um, gold has done in the past. And for full disclosure, I do have um, funds I write for, where I write, produce content for them. Uh, who are gold focused, but they all have their foot down in the Bitcoin landscape as well. So I sort of see the both or the best of both worlds. Um, but hands down, if I do the comparison, the only place where Bitcoin loses is the volatility. And that's just a question of time until we sorted that one out. Thanks, Joel. That's extremely interesting um, and an interesting perspective. Um, for me, I'm Bitcoin only. Gold is something that I haven't really considered um and i think a lot of bitcoin well i say a lot of bitcoin i don't know um but the general feel i get there is a lot of bitcoiners that are saying well if you're not just exclusively bitcoin then you're not a bitcoin and this is where the toxicity toxicity comes into play uh with with some bitcoiners and and their um opinions about um whether people should be having other assets including gold what what do you think about the toxic uh, maximalist um, thought process and and um, argument around gold? I mean, first and foremost, if I look at my holdings, um, is it really possible to say I only hold Bitcoin? Because I'm sure a lot of those very toxic Bitcoin maxis, um, mm. they also hold some form of fiat. They do have phones. They do have um, possibly houses. These are all, at the end of the day, assets you could technically liquidate or sell. So um, it's always a matter of perspective. But yeah, completely. Um, I get the critics. Um, unfortunately, I think that this is really a blind spot to the Bitcoin community. We often dismiss a lot of things in a very simple manner. What I mean by that is if we don't like something, it's like, oh, you don't get it or you read have fun staying poor which adds to the toxicity right. and to the signal and everything yeah but then sometimes not everyone takes don't trust verify very seriously which is a shame i think mm -hmm. but at the end of the day yeah, if, if i need to choose between gold and bitcoin fuck it i'm choosing bitcoin just from a standpoint because i can get it i can save it but i can also spend it in different forms i can't spend gold i can only get it and save in it and if i might have kids or people who live long after me, I could then give them my gold coins or my gold bars or whatever. Um, but this is more of a savings technology, I would say. Um, if I really want to invest into gold, I have to speculate on the price. That price is very much controlled by a lot of banks. There's a JP Morgan case, which just closed, I think a couple of weeks ago, how they manipulated gold and silver with a couple of traders. Um, so there are all of these aspects where I'm like, is it worth it trading that stuff or sort of going for, into it from that mindset? Whereas with Bitcoin, if you understand the cycles, if you understand what halvings are and how these things work, um, I think it's easier to make your buck if that's your goal. If you want to buy Bitcoin at one price, sell it at another or take your profits, um, there's no question about it. That's easier with Bitcoin any day of the week. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if someone's walking up to me on the street and they're like, hey, do you want a 10 ounces of gold? Um, I'll take it. I'll probably liquidate a big part of that into Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> but I think it's always good to have some of these commodities to your side as well and understand what they are. Um, but yeah, currently I'm more into Bitcoin than anything else. I maybe have like 4% in gold. Um, and that's just stuff I get from like grandparents and such when I was young or when I was born. Um, that's sort of a tradition in, in the German speaking area. 
um, that you get like gold coins when you're born. Um, so oh, yeah, right. but so that's does, the only does thing your, does your, does your, where you're from have an influence then with, with, with that then, if that's kind of a cultural thing? I you. think so. I think so. Cause, um, as I mentioned, when you're born, at least in Switzerland, you get some, um, we call it friendly. So these are like golden coins essentially. Okay. And I think they are 20 or 25 grams or maybe I'm mistaken. Let me just, uh, friendly wait. These are essentially gold tokens. Mm. Um, here we are. And they are wait. I want to see the weight. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't want to see the price. <laughs> what um, is the price? The price is essentially it's a 20 P coin in Swiss currency. Okay. Okay. But obviously it's more worth it than that because it's made pure out of gold. Um, I could say I can 5.8 zero five grams so even less okay. than what i said and you right. just get that when you're born um or you get that from relatives when you're born at least that's where i grew up in switzerland but i also know a lot of friends of mine from germany austria when they like graduated school you got these things as a graduation gift um so i guess it's inherited i mean switzerland used to steal jewish gold to save from god for nazis so there is a connection to gold again um a bad yeah. connection and right. uh, I'm sure but the Germans and Austria have as well. Exactly, exactly. I'm interested. Um, did you, when you moved to England, um, can you see if there's any, or can, do you, is there any cultural difference with, with the way we treat money here compared to Switzerland? Um, is there yeah, a yeah. cultural difference with with way we handle money? Um, can you give us some insight on that? Yeah, I, I think you guys spend it in an immaculate pace. Um, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that the Swiss are like super cheap and they don't spend because Switzerland is the direct comparison I could draw because I lived there for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Swiss are more sort of, I think a bit laid back. They try to keep and save in money or they're very quickly trying to get a house. Um, a getting a house in Switzerland is fucking expensive and you're basically in debt for life. Uh, you just can't go to a bank and say like, Hey, the house is half a mil. I'll pay half a mil in cash. If you actually do that, you get like a tax <laughs> as a, oh, really? as punishment. Yeah. So it's a bit different from that perspective. Um, so that's why you, people generally don't spend as much and they focus more on saving. Um, and, and not so many people have credit cards in Switzerland. So shit like this, um, mm. is where Britain, especially I, I, I have friends here have like four or five credit cards. I'm like, how the fuck do you do this? Just like the, the APR to pay back on the credit card is like 20%. This, this is outrageous, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But all of these things, um, these are the vast differences, I would say. But then having said that again, because you guys spend more, I also see a lot more happier faces. And what I mean is people are open to going to the pub after work here. You don't really do that in Switzerland. You, you meet once or twice maybe, but you don't do that every day. And you guys, because you're in that spending mode, you're most sociable. You go to football yeah. games, to sporting events. But we're big events, drinkers so. culturally anyway here in the UK. Yeah. Um, we yeah. do like a pint. Um, so with, with that cultural um, aspect um, in mind, what, what do your parents take? Um, or what do your family um, think about Bitcoin? And um, have they given you any kind of um, of the FUD that they've heard? And are, are they sold in on it? Um, what, what's, your, what's your family think of Bitcoin? I mean, it's a hard, it, it was a hard sell for a long time for me because my mum, she used to be a banker. Um, so she obviously had that very one-sided mindset. Um, and I mean, not every banker is a, is a gangster or anything They're legit. I also have friends of them who just doing it to get their bills paid at the end of the day, but they have a very specific way about looking at these things. And that was a hard sell for me, but I think the, the pandemic helped for both my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, cause they realized, Hey, wait a minute. Um, they, they immediately got the, the money printing dangerous. So they're like, if we handing out money just for the sake of it, um, and we continue to print that money, shit is going to happen in the near future. 
And my mom, obviously, with her background, she then moved away from banking and she became an expert in like um, uh, taxes and um, accounting and all of these things, sort of um, optimizing your financials to that standpoint. Um, she then very quickly realized, hey, within two years, we're going to have massive inflation and we need an asset, which if I buy it now, even if it goes up or down, in two years, I'm still in in the dark, essentially, and mm -hmm. it's a hedge against that inflation. So she bought gold, I think. She also bought silver and she bought Bitcoin because she asked me like, hey, I think at that point it was trading at like five, 6,000. Should I go in? Um, she also bought some other cryptocurrencies just to compare and Bitcoin was the one outperforming everything. So she stuck around. That's really good. Um, and I met your mum um, over in Amsterdam. Um, mm. She came to the the Bitcoin conference. So I dragged and, her along. Uh, <laughs> you dragged her along, but um, you, you've, I think you fully orange peeled um, your mum. So props to you, buddy. <laughs> and um, yeah, my dad was easier. My dad was easier in that respect. Oh, really? Because um, yeah, yeah, my dad was always so. Um, quick backstory on him: he's Swiss, but he used to be Italian. Both of his parents okay. were Italian and back in the, my dad was born in 1964 and in the 70s, 80s, when you grew up Italian in Switzerland, this is basically the same as, I don't know, if you were, I guess, um, Indian back in the days coming to the UK. So people treated you like shit um, because you were a different culture. You sort of, um, the persona non grata. Um, and because of that, he's always very anti-government anti-socialist governments, especially because uh, the region they were living in Italy initially was controlled by hardcore socialists and that brought in a lot of poverty okay. for them and stuff like that. So he didn't trust the government at all. He never trusted banks at all. Uh, he always used to be when I was little, the guy running around with cash only, even though bank, <laughs> bank cards existed. Um, so for him, it was an easy sell. I was like, you know, he had problems with the technical aspects of it all. But once I got him through self-custody, what is a hardware wallet, a cold wallet, a hot wallet. Um, yeah, he, he got it and he actually explained the, the economical benefits to my mum. So um, that was quite funny. She, she just took the longest because obviously she was more involved into the, the classical TradFi world, I would say. Yeah, and, and being in, in banking as well, I imagine that, mm. you know, that the mindset was slightly different. Um, but yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned earlier on uh, briefly that you started looking into the mining aspect of, of Bitcoin. Is that something you're still interested in? Um, is that something you, you're still involved with? And um, what, what's your sort of um, view on the whole Bitcoin mining um, as it is today? I know that they're, they're having a lot of issues with, with, with mining in terms of um, you've, you've had a couple of miners um, go bankrupt and things like that because they're leveraging funds and things like that. Um, so what's, what's your viewpoint on the whole mining situation? I mean, I, I look at mining from a very uh, scientific aspect, meaning I see it or look at it as a energy alternative solution and it takes a lot mm. of uh, hours you need to invest in and a lot of research to understand every aspect fully, but to, to break it down very simple, mining is not just, I have this, this center with like a billion gazillion ASICs and I need to pluck them into the wall and that's how mining works. Um, it's a lot more complex and they are legit different, uh, alternatives these days where I can utilize truly renewable energy, not the, the ESG fucking mainstream BS that's being sold um, and actually offload the grid and essentially build an energy solution for a, a monetary standard that's incredible. We all know that, but then possibly also helping that grid out in the future. So I'm looking at it from that perspective. And to be honest, Ian, I, I mean, I live on the outside skirt of London, the, the city that is. And uh, electricity is expensive here, obviously. So, but it's I'll, ridiculously I, expensive, yeah. If I would live outside in the countryside and I would have access to cheap electricity, I would have a couple of ASICs at home. Mining Bitcoin from the source directly, amazing. 
And then on the other hand, just um, how you can then offset that energy and use it to a different perspective. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more pain in the mining industry. Uh, it's just basic math if you, if you do the calculations. But at the end of the day, the upside is so much bigger. And um, I also have a couple of projects I'm involved with that did start that renewable energy source or road down there. And uh, it's incredible what they can do in the next four years from what I've seen in planning and such. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll just need to give them some time. Again, the bankruptcies are unfortunate, but, um, yeah, yeah, human greed, human error again, right? So, um, but the market will continue. This is how it's always been in bear markets with Bitcoin. The minor capitulation is, is real and it's painful for a lot of people, but um, it washes out the, the bad players and the good ones survive and keep going. Yeah, and, and with the FUD that goes around generated by the central authorities and the central bank and things like that about um, Bitcoin's energy use um, and the um, the FUD that goes along with it, um, all that's really done is, is um, created a situation where Bitcoin uh, mining is at the forefront of discovering new technologies for mm. renewable energies. Um, and obviously you compare the energy use to the current banking system and all it entails. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's ridiculous just comparing the two um, and extremely hypocritical if you actually look at the numbers, um, obviously, because they're trying to attack Bitcoin because obviously it puts um, everything they've built um, it threatens everything they've, they've built. Um, but environmentally, um, I think Bitcoin is only going to sort of make, uh, better and more efficient, uh, and cleaner, um, energy sources available. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's, that, I think that's, that's, that's my view on, on mining anyway. Um, what, what about you environmentally? I mean, I, I'm not the biggest, um, so I'm not a Fridays for Future supporter. Uh, Greta Thunberg is a fucking bitch. Um, <laughs> just look at who the people are who are financing her. Um, doesn't take. Who, who's, fin who, who's financing her? I mean, you've got different names there. You've got George Soros. He's been openly supporting her ever since. Mm -hmm. um, you got the, um, oh, what's the name of the One Wealthy um, Oil Fund that's been helping her. Uh, I'm trying to find the right name there. You got Al Gore, who is a climate hypocrite because the fortune of, of his family has been made with oil, I think oil, gas, and uh, tobacco. So everything horribly for the environment. The fuck has made millions out of it or billions. Flies of private chats um, by complaining to us if we go on holiday two times a year. So um, again, this is the hypocrisy I'm having an issue with, but this is just typical if you look at everything in the world. But then at the real issue, I think, is we do have some form of environmental crisis to be talked about. Um, it's actually one shock. You asked me previously, what's the difference between London and Switzerland? Um, mm. London is fucking filthy. Yeah. If I compare the UK in terms of recycling and all of the rubbish laying around to what you see in Switzerland, it, the back of my, the neck of my hair stand up. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, these are topics we need to discuss and we need to find solutions. And that's not what's being done in the traditional environmentalist way. He also mainstream media, which we'll get into later for sure. Um, it's very typical to say, look at this player. He's the bad guy. The reason responsible for this crisis, even though it's mathematically impossible. And as you said, I think we're spending about 44 gigatons a year on CO2 mm -hmm. emissions or something like that with Bitcoin. The banking sector is at like 8,000 or something like this, or 800, I might be exaggerating a bit. Um, again, I can search the direct numbers. Um, but this is a vast comparison and you sort of shine the light on one player who, if you look at the Bitcoin mining space in particular, 60% of it apparently is used with renewables. So it's only 40% right. of the whole space that is the bad player. Um, and if you look what you do, the energy you use gets produced into a Bitcoin, which can be traded all around the world. Um, it incentivizes human rights. It really helps people in all different shapes and forms. Um, how can you look at this and thinking, 
it's spoiling the oceans just because it's not the way money has been set up the past 85 years. Um, and I mean, if we want to talk about boiling the oceans, let's compare gold mining to Bitcoin mining. And that's where you really get the biggest issues because I think gold mining is even five or six times worse than the whole banking sector. So these are evolutions. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's the, the biggest issue. There is a comparison table available for everyone to download. You could do the research, don't trust verify, but, but people are just too lazy because they read it in a newspaper. They don't take up extra time to Google and to check what uh, possibly could be even bigger than what Bitcoin is offering currently. Um, you know, yes, a lot of the Bitcoin mining is, is being used by renewable sources, but also like energy is being, uh, it's almost like a dirty word now. Um, yeah. Energy is, energy is a good thing. We need energy and we need more of it um, for us to sort of um, go to, in that next step in our in our story as human beings um especially when we're talking about um taking to the stars and exploring other planets and things like that which is going to be inevitable um you know you've got to look at you know the projects that are going on uh, by certain billionaires and and, <laughs> and sorts the appetite is out there because they're obviously looking for other resources as well um to to um, you know, take advantage of, but also to expand, expand the human story. Yeah. And I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if you looked at, if you looked at uh, the whole history of human civilization, modern civilization, whether that be in the 1800s or whether that be today, some form of energy was always at the storefront for conversation, good or bad. Um, it used to be oil. Remember the petrodollar wars? I don't mm -hmm. remember, I wasn't born, but I read about them. Um, I mean, people were fighting over, should we allow the US uh, super monopoly with the petrodollar? Should there be other alternatives? Born out of that whole fiasco was sort of the euro that also got dragged into these things um, way earlier than that. If you go back to like the JP Morgan days when they were founded, um, they invested heavily into oil. There's a lot of right. back and forth possible um, manipulation going on and how to, they got to that point. But oil, which was used to create energy back in the days, or even longer than that, coal. Uh, I mean, if I think about the Peaky Blinders uh, in the 1900s in Birmingham, with all of their uh, coal industries and all of their um, industrial stuff happening up there to basically just have enough energy to uh, ship it down to London. These are all materials that you transform into energy so why are we fussing about something that uses energy to transform into something valuable that incentivizes saving and not over consuming this is mind-boggling to me but again i have a historical well, they, they, they can't control it they, they just can't they, they don't they, they want to capital they want to, to to control and dominate it and they can't uh and that and that is only gonna make them fearful and create all this 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 fud about it um so yeah yeah um all right is there anything you want to add or anything i haven't asked about your rabbit hole story that you thought would be quite interesting to talk about yeah i mean sort of the elephant in the room if you know me is um i'm very critical of, of the media landscape um that has a reason behind it um and and just the whole human rights thing, I think, is a, is a big part. We can we can get into the later half of the of my episode here, because um, that will have a lot of impact, I think, in the near future for Bitcoin. Okay, so let's get into it then. Um, human rights aspect. What, what's um, what's your viewpoint on on human rights and how does it relate to Bitcoin? I mean, first of all, if you look at the last two years, again, personal opinion, my end. Everyone can have a different viewpoint. Um, it's been absolutely crazy what uh, the basis of necessity to live as a human being is and what's been taken from us. I mean, the ability to move freely, to decide on your own will and all of these things, they've been taken from us in a very dramatical fashion, all under the safeguard of um, we want to keep you safe and no one should die um, without, I don't know, um, not being able to meet everyone or whatever. Um, and then once you start questioning, like, okay, hang on, if they can lock me in my house because of whatever's going on, 
can I take my money? Can I take my property? Can I take my kids? If you have kids, whatever. So it starts worrying you. And what I find fascinating is Bitcoin is a solution down so many levels. Um, whether that be the monetary one. So they are people living in Iran. they are women, especially living in that region who, which I didn't know, don't have access to bank accounts. Uh, this is something I learned through Bitcoin, that there are people in the world who are still unbanked because of hierarchy. Um, I knew that that was going on in, in different versions or regions of the world. And I knew that um, cash and other payment systems had a different meaning there. But um, yeah, I have a friend who lives in like uh, one of the rapid Emirates somewhere down there. She's like, well, my mom wasn't allowed to have a bank account. Thank God my dad was always very open with her. And he told her how much bills are and what he's doing. But she couldn't walk into a bank. With Bitcoin now, she can have her own money. Um, and I mean, I think she even outperformed her husband. So that's also a big benefit there. But just from that aspect, so I can have Bitcoin as a monetary exchange. Um, it's something no one can take away from me. That's the second thing. Uh, if you look at Africa, there's so many different uh, countries still living in colonialism because there's a central bank in France or a central bank in another country of the world controlling their money or controlling their wealth. Uh, that's the second aspect where a lot of people in these regions are like, hey, we get Bitcoin because even though the price might go up and down, uh, at least we can hold it on our own terms. Uh, yes, you can make the point that it's very Western focused Bitcoin, I would say. Um, a lot of the development stuff, for example, is happening in the States, but I think it's sort of expanding at the moment. Um, and you'll definitely see more of that happening in, in, in Africa and Asia as well. Um, and then the third point, and very importantly, because I've seen that with my own eyes, is even though Bitcoin has a huge volatility right now, especially in the bear market, this is still a safer bet for millions of people out there than their regular money. They, they're used to inflation of 120% plus. At one point, I even spoke to a friend of mine. He lives in uh, South Sudan. Uh, he is from there. His parents went back from Switzerland to Sudan back in the 80s, and he was born later on. They had an inflation of about 450% or something like this just recently. Wow. It's growing every day wow. and money just disappears. So for them to be able to use Bitcoin, even with its volatility as savings compared to that, I mean, Bitcoin has been down last year, like what, 65%, 70% maybe. Mm -hmm. I bet in that year alone, they had inflation of about 250, 270%. So if you do these comparisons, you're like, holy shit, this is not just money that we can spend and save in and possibly do a great return, but this mm. is really the last resort for a lot of these people. And um, this is one of the many things that bothers me if I like see the, the billionaires on TV calling it a scam without actually understanding it. Um, they would never make the effort to go into these countries to understanding these stories because they're part of the problem. They're part of being close to that um, money printer. Um, and I mean, it's taken on a form of, in some countries, Afghanistan, for example, having Bitcoin became a movement against terrorists, against uh, back then the local government. So I think from that perspective, well, it, it takes in a social economical standpoint, which is phenomenal to see. Um, and it takes a, a social aspect where you would say, holy shit, this internet money thing that was founded 14 years ago. Uh, this is actually taken on forms where it, it, it's a symbol against tyranny and it's a symbol against all of these things. Uh, plus, it has all of the benefits. It makes wars unaffordable. That's one of the most popular sayings. Um, its monetary policy has been giving into the future forever. You, you can look up what the next halving will be in 2068 or whatever. You know what the rewards will be. Based upon that, you can calculate inflation which will decrease every time the halvings take place. Um, so it's a disinflationary, not a deinflationary. That's a big mistake a lot of people make, technically speaking. Um, assets that will just appreciate in time. And even, even if we get to a point where Bitcoin will hit, I'm saying something, a million per coin, um, obviously not very soon. I think that takes a bit of time. Um, yeah. And it will just have that price forever. Um, that's the basis to build that monetary system on um, and then build different things as we see it now, because it can also be an underlying asset for uh, a freedom of speech platform with Nostra. 
or just a protocol to talk to people. It can be a basis for video chat. I'm sure it will be a basis for different kinds of exchanges. Um, so yeah, just looking at all of that and how each of this use case can be used by oppressed people who now finally have a weapon that no one can take away from them. How you look at this and calling it a scam, I don't know. Where do you see Bitcoin in, in 10 years with all that in mind? Um, so another 10 years time, do what, what's going to be built on top of Bitcoin, do you think? And, and, uh, and what, what changes are we going to see globally with, with, um, people's human rights? I mean, I think in a human rights aspect, we'll definitely see the next 10 years will be hard, uh, for human rights activists living under the oppression of a, a tyrannical state and the, the pressure that NGOs, um, so-called good organizations in air marks or quotation marks, sorry, um, put on these institutions or people, because even if you look at, um, NGOs that are wanting to do good at some form, you'll have a billionaire backing them. And then at one point he's going to say, Hey, I won't, I will stop giving you 10 million a year. If you continue supporting Bitcoin, guess what the NGO will do? They cut off Bitcoin because they need the fucking money because they don't have business plans to survive on their own. Um, one of the draw sides to these NGOs. So I think from a human rights perspective, human rights will definitely feel the heat of the um, will fight you stage because that's where we're heading to. Um, right. And yeah, I, I could definitely see a lot of prisoners getting called out because they own Bitcoin. Even in, um, was it in Afghanistan, Iran or Iraq? I can't remember. A couple of weeks ago where one guy was prosecuted for educating people about Bitcoin um, still in prison, we'll see um, privacy, a big part of, in my opinion, the Bitcoin culture. Unfortunately, it's getting washed away a bit. Um, I think that will play a big part again. And just from a human rights aspect, the more people we can get in from these countries and the more people we can convince in, I don't know, Africa, Asia, um, uh, isolated parts of the world that, hey, the people don't invest. who need Bitcoin the most. Yeah. Exactly. And don't invest mm -hmm. your, your money into crypto scams. Cause unfortunately that's what's happening, especially in Africa. Right. You see this a lot cause it's a quick way for them to make life changing money. Um, if they get away from that and only focus on Bitcoin and we teach them what they can build on top of Bitcoin, um, I could definitely see maybe, um, grassroots movements, how you saw, uh, different organizations come about in the Western world being bought out of Bitcoin and really having a strong base of people who understand what money is, understand the dangers to the money printer, fractional reserve banking. And who knows, we might be seeing an uprising. The CFA, the Central Front American, uh, Africa, sorry. This is one of the biggest oppression tools France uses to still hold 16 countries in Africa small, or maybe 15, 15 or 16. I'm not sure about the exact number. Um, I, I would like to bet my hand on it that we'll see one or two of these countries uprise and sort of break free from that tyranny. That takes 10 years or more, obviously. So I'm not yeah. expecting it tomorrow, but I think that's what we see from a human rights aspect. Um, and in terms of financial products, even though I don't like it, I think we'll see a lot more derivatives being built on Bitcoin. That's what happened with gold, uh, the gold contracts, future contracts, um, the gold stocks came about. Um, and you already see it in Bitcoin. I mean, miners went public. You can trade that stock next to owning and believing in a Bitcoin ecosystem. I think that will, that's inevitable. That will happen. Um, from a, from a base layer standpoint, Bitcoin is the perfect base layer for derivatives because it, it can't be manipulated in terms of like what gold could do with paper gold and such. Um, and you can really verify that people own Bitcoin or not. But then again, we get into that human greed aspect. You see with all of the exchanges going bust in all of mm. these yield products, they abused Bitcoin to build yield products and build that financial infrastructure on top of that. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. But then on the flip side, um, hey, we'll also possibly see even better products like uh, Nostr. We'll also see, I'm sure, different communication models being built on Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, who knows? Uh, technology is evolving. Maybe in 10 years time, we're all heating our homes with Bitcoin miners instead of a uh, central heating system. So why not?
Yeah, I was thinking that it would be pretty cool to have uh, devices in your house that just like double up as Bitcoin miners. Um, yeah, I think I think that's definitely where we're going to go in the future. They're probably highly unprofitable now, and they'll be yeah. for a lot of time. But it's they cool will, to have yeah. that one at home. <laughs> it would be very cool. Cool. So moving away then from um, the rabbit hole story, just a couple of generalized questions for you um, before we have a close to the podcast um for today um what's your view on um cbdc's oh jesus um <laughs> trying to keep it neutral uh a there are, again bringing it back to the human rights aspect they the the digital form of tyranny or the purest digital form of tyranny you can have because they can talk about it being transparent and open and, you know, oh, look, it's a blockchain. You can look up what we published. The magic yeah, word mother- blockchain. Yeah. 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 Motherfucker. Blockchain is just a, a slow <laughs> database yeah. that you can manipulate at the end of the day. Because yeah. there's public blockchains, there's private blockchains. I could build my own blockchain for my business and I could set a consensus on that. And there could be a backdoor to control everything. So. Just looking at it from a, a surveillance perspective, I mean, we're being surveilled every day with our phones and everything, but it's just another, it's another level deeper that really frightens me. Because um, mm-hmm. now we have the options of, we can own cash, um, we can own offshore accounts. Um, Switzerland was famous for that in the 70s and 80s, still is, by the way, because um, all of the terrorist organizations and all of the uh, wealthy individuals still have their Swiss bank accounts. Um, but we had that possibility if we only live on CBDC. So if that's the only fiat option, fuck me, they see where your money is going to literally every place and they'll be able mm-hmm. to shut you out based on just your purchasing, uh, dilemma. If, if your you carbon that, footprint as well. Yeah. Wh- whatever the fuck they want to call it. Um, Mm. They, they see you to which parties, um, and I'm not talking political parties, but maybe, you know, uh, Bitcoin organizations or, I don't know, maybe sports organizations they don't like you contribute to. And this really takes on a dystopian future, which is very dangerous. Um, and it takes into shape a form of money that you feel been programmed for a very long time, but they never had the incentives set up for them to... Uh, to actually do it. If they have the capability to execute a CBDC, that's a whole different story because um, it's technology. Bitcoin is technology. Money is technology. And um, I would pretty much put my um, my hat in the ring or my hat in play. Um, if there's a CBDC being developed on whatever platform, whatever thing, there's a counter group who can attack that CBDC. Right. The hacking groups... Uh, there are cyberpunks out there. I know a few of them personally, and they're like, you know what? If shit hits the fan, and we know this is the release date of that CBDC, fuck it. We're going for a stateside attack. If they're doing the same thing to us, we're just changing the format. So I think it's a David versus Goliath fight, especially in that circumstance. It's not a fight we technically lose, but we just go up against an opponent that has infinite sources of money, infinite sources of different technology they can use. So th- th- that's the scary part of me, but I'm, I'm an optimist first. So I sort of have that spark in the back of my head. Um, I'm a big Iron Rant uh, uh, fan. So um, <laughs> one man can change the motor of the world from turning. Uh, and I feel like this is possible with CBDCs as well. It takes a lot of effort, possibly a lot of guts, but we're not at the point yet where I feel we've lost because we still have Bitcoin. We also have... Um, other tools to um, possibilities and they have to convince the central bank to essentially also play in part with what these governments or these organizations want. So I feel there's a lot of like ego fighting going on right. and we just need to use that time for them to, um, to, to hold build. against <laughs> yeah, and to build. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if all things break, fucking attack that shit. Um, I'm not a hacker. I'm sure a lot of people are very talented. Um, and yeah, sort of aspire to the decency of people working on that stuff that, um, this is not the future you want for your kids. This is straight out of the Terminator 
um, uh, call sheet to where AI is rising and sort of destroying humanization, human life after all. So yeah, not good. Definitely not a support. Uh, CPTCs need to be stopped at all costs. Um, but it's up to us to stop that. We, we, we can't trust politicians because they can be fucking bored. They have been bored yeah. and they will always be bored. And it's up to us, um, plebs to our citizens to form. And I mean, you see that in all different shapes and sizes. Um, you see that in the media landscape, sort of the citizen journalist aspect of it all. Right. You see it in, in the media space, like media, the podcasting space. You see, we just sit together. You don't have a background in media or uh, in, uh, not in media, in podcasting. I don't have a background in podcasting. We managed to sit together and, and f found this show. So I think there's a lot of that movement happening. And it has to come from the ground up. That's the, the one right. essential thing to beat this thing. Fascinating. Um, so I, I, I take it you're not a fan of CBDCs. I think that's, mm -mm. that's the answer. <laughs> no, fuck them. Uh, <laughs> I join you on that one, Joel. Of course I do. Um, who's Bitcoin number one? Who's Bitcoin en enemy number one in your mind? Enemy number one. Good question. Who? To be honest, the biggest enemy is KYC, in my opinion. Mm, okay, for interesting. Those of you not, for those of you not in the know, KYC stands for Know Your Customers. And it's basically a fucking law. Corrupt politicians and gangsters in banks invented because they used loopholes for centuries um, where they would mund the loan, uh, mund the, uh, loan money, the money sorry. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, where they would use offshore bank accounts, all of these different things, and they're punishing us to upload our identity, bound every financial transaction to us. So I think if you look at the historical standpoint, again, from Bitcoin's end, cyberpunks had a big push in privacy. And I think one of the biggest dangers is KYC. With that, um, I'm a strong believer against regulation. From a simple standpoint, that regulation has been set up by, again, corrupt institutions. Just look at the state side, the SEC, the CFTC, how they were called. They were in the whole FTX debacle. They were right at the storefront. Um, they didn't do anything, didn't do any shit, didn't then protect anyone. Um, but yet they want to have this magical thing called regulation because they want to, again, determine at the table what people should do and what should, they shouldn't do. So I think so. KYC... <laughs> regulation is to me the biggest danger and you can then combine it to everything I, I hate it if i see michael saylor talking about regulation and i hate if i see michael saylor telling you to only buy bitcoin kyc i don't think that's a smart idea i think you can have your kyc stack i'm also a big proponent of having a non-kyc stack um yeah and having different different solutions to to your bitcoin needs um so mixed into all of that i think that's the the enemy number one some might say the mit i don't know i'm not a big believer in that um some might say individual names but i think kyc and that right of privacy they take again basic human right you have the right to privacy um that's sort of the biggest danger i see do you think the <clears throat> shit coins um and the the behavior of a lot of the exchanges have um, given the politicians and the central banks and the people that are um, against Bitcoin the excuse to bring in regulation. Because obviously mm -hmm. a, a lot of the, um, well, I say a lot, all of the shit coins are Ponzi schemes and the scams and um, they are just like Bitcoin unregulated, but because of the behavior of these organizations in the crypto space and on the, on the exchanges, it's, it's wrecked a lot of people, um, uh, because they've either been greedy or they've just not done their research and their homework. Whereas, um, Bitcoin is a different kettle of fish entirely. Um, it doesn't, um, operate in any way like the cryptos because obviously um it's decentralized unlike any of the other ones um and you can take it obviously into your own self custody uh and look after it and it's it's um separate from the the cryptos but obviously with what's been going on with these exchanges 
Um, do you think that's given the politicians the ammunition that they've, they've wanted to use against Bitcoin? I think definitely. And um, out of all of the, the different Bitcoin teams that have been formed in the past few months and weeks, um, I'm definitely on the team that stuff like FTX that, that didn't happen overnight. And I will no. not be surprised if you see stateside attacks against Bitcoin formed right. out in that sort of manner. Um, on the other, other hand, from past experience with friends, family, all of those shit coins eventually lead to Bitcoin. And um, if I look at the regular bloke who's, who, who gets that he wants to save in Bitcoin and he wants to accumulate as much as possible, but if the altcoins are trading up like 200% and he wants to use them to get more Bitcoin, I'm like, okay, not the perfect form, but at least you end up in Bitcoin and all roads eventually lead to Bitcoin. So I'd say, yeah, it, it definitely helps to convince people of Bitcoin's use case because as soon as you have a central authority or a central point of failure in your system, it's not secure. It goes against what Satoshi envisioned with Bitcoin. Um, and it's an easy argument to us, for us to make to be pro Bitcoin, but obviously it's a harder sell. The more FTXs collapse, the more of these um, high yield, uh, I don't want you to call them Ponzi schemes happen, mm -hmm. the harder it is to, for us to convince people of that. But I'm, I'm a big proponent of, um, or a big um, uh, enthusiast, sorry, of um, people have to touch the hot stove at least twice, possibly three times in their lives to realize that they shouldn't do it. So um, I think they just need a couple of these upsets or a couple of these um, painful moments with shit coins to realize that, hey, if I want to stay in, in crypto, I have the biggest danger of um, getting my hands burned. Or if I just want uh, uh, an asset that incentivizes me to, to save and to look for a brighter future, I could go down the Bitcoin road. Um, and if we can make the use case, however form that might take or happen, I'm happy for these events. But obviously it hurts if you see people losing their life savings um, because they were told by their influencer friend or by the people they follow on YouTube that everything mm -hmm. is risk-free. Um, yeah. There's nothing, if there's one thing in economics you learn, there's never a free lunch or there's nothing like a free lunch. So also take these things into consideration. Um, Bitcoin on purpose doesn't have yield built into the protocol or whatever. Um, and in my opinion, this is not how the world works. If you get a yield, someone's paying for it. Um, and you have to have that painful lesson to, to realize that that is the case. And if that leads you to Bitcoin, perfect. If not, you still have some time and ticking to do. Brilliant. Joel, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing um, a bit more about yourself and, and um, your viewpoint on all things Bitcoin. Um, what is there to expect next next episode? I mean, well, it's, it's getting to the end of uh, a month soon on Rabbit Hole Stories. So you'll definitely also have us two back for a teacup soon. But we have some guests lined up um, besides ourselves where you'll hear their rabbit hole stories and where we also hear their um, journey into Bitcoin. I think it will be a bit more focused on how they got into Bitcoin, why they stuck around. Obviously, with our episodes now, we also showcase what our beliefs are and all of these things. Um, but yeah, you'll definitely see a lot of exciting guests, I would say. And um, really guests, which I would say are not your typical Bitcoin. So they might not be a dev, they might not be um, a big CEO of like a Bitcoin company or whatever. Um, they're just regular Joes who are doing their work um and understood what they can do with bitcoin so yeah looking forward to these ones yeah me too i'm looking forward to actually speaking to other bitcoiners in the space and getting getting their rabbit hole stories as well it's something i'm really looking forward to so um with that joel let's let's wrap this up and um let's um see you next time perfect thank you for interviewing me ian that was a, a different than usually usually i'm on the other side but um, yeah, I hope everyone had um, some ideas, some shape and forms, what I believe in. And obviously, if you want to reach out, uh, the links are always in the show notes. So don't hesitate. And I'm looking forward to the next one and seeing or hearing from every one of you um, out there in the 
into worlds of the Bitcoin space. Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. And I'll see you next time, mate.